Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Um, my name is Cecile. Uh, you guys can hear me clearly? Yeah? Okay. So, welcome. I'm so glad to... I don't see anybody, but I guess you guys are here. Okay. So, my name is Cecile Fendi, and uh, I'm a teacher, I'm an educator, I'm a gardener, I'm an activist, and I'm really glad to be able to speak to you today. So, I teach at Little Sun People, which is an Afrocentric daycare in uh, Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, and I teach uh, French through songs and movement to children two to five, and I also lead a uh, French immersion after school, and my class is called Macandes. So I have a very alternative way of teaching. So I teach through yoga, through singing, history, science, visual art, sculpture, and also cooking. That's why I'm here. Yes, <coughs> cooking. So I cook a lot of um, recipes from uh, the African continent. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more uh, about my background, who I am, why I'm here, and all of that. So I created a school garden uh, at PS262 in 2014, and I led the project for about four years. It was in my daughter's school. I am a master composter. I hold a master degree in fine art. Um, I recently started going to school for a master in general education and special education in Manhattan, Turo College. And I also, um, sorry, I'm trying to, to read what I have in front of me and I can't see it. <laughs> okay, sorry guys. So I'm really dedicated to fight our racism in all form. So let me try to continue. And I don't know how. I was telling you guys how I was teaching. And the last thing I wanted to tell you is that at some point I had um, my own structure, like my own little school. So it was called Quaba. I had like a French play group between 2017 and 2019. And it was based on Montessori and Reggio philosophies which are a little bit different from, you know, what you can see in, uh, in uh, I would say, DOE. Okay, so after that, I started um, really, um, I'm, I've always been really dedicated to fight racism in any form. So we're going to go more in depth about what this workshop is about. So. The next slide, the slide that you see now, it's about my roots and my ancestry. Why I want to talk about that? Because that's really how to introduce um, myself, my passion of gardening. Where does that come from? It comes from my dad, basically, who is from Benin, West Africa. And I always used to be with him in the garden when I was little. So our garden had papayas, lime, avocados, grapefruit any plant you could imagine um, in Africa. So the other big influence that I have uh, with this strong connection to the earth is my grandfather on my mother's side. So that's on my French side. So he used to plant his little potatoes, like he, his little garden in the back, in the backyard. And he's also a farmer, like huge farm with cereal. Uh, in France. So next slide, you can see my grandfather and my father. So those are my roots. Then this is my classroom with my lovely children that are so happy to learn about <laughs> African cooking. They, as you can see, they are so excited, smiling. All right, so this is what I want to talk about. Black Lives Matters and Black Curriculum Matters. 
Cooking is a complete learning experience. Why? Because it's sensorial. It means that the kids use all their five senses. When I do a recipe, I don't do it like um, I teach in an alternative way, as I said. So I use a lot of Montessori principles. I make the children smell the spices. I make them look at drawings on a poster. So I will write the recipe, but not in a classic way. I will draw most of the stuff. So if children with special needs um, that cannot hear, that cannot see, or, you know, there's many different special need uh, kids out there. So I always adapt it depending on the needs of the kids. So these recipes, basically, when you cook with kids, there's a lot of social emotional skills that are in play. Um, we do a lot of math with measuring cups. Um, there's a cultural exploration. As you can see, I have my map right here. It's never too far. <laughs> I explore the entire continent uh, with uh, recipes from all over Africa. So I also do a lot of history of crops when it's needed. Um, and I teach uh, kids uh, geography. Before I do the recipes, I always introduce the country with the flag and what the country, like, what are we talking about, basically. And the connection with the ancestry is pretty obvious. And deep learning. So let's go in more in depth with what I'm saying. So this is the most important part that I really want you guys to get from how I teach cooking in the classroom. So this is more like a classroom management type of tips. So I'm gonna go over it. And if you guys have more questions afterwards, I can answer. So this is how I do it. I divide the group in little smaller groups, three or four children. I make sure they all wash their hands. I send all the groups to wash the ingredients, different groups, like I give them different um, tasks. And then I protect my tables with whatever I have um, to make it sanitary. I clean. I start setting up all my cutting boards. If I don't have enough cutting boards, I use paper plates. And then I distribute plastic knives to everybody. So that's how we start the, the recipe. But prior, during the, the week, I've already given, given the kids uh, an introduction of the country I'm going to talk about. So this is fri prior in the week, okay? So we usually cook on Fridays. And the way I start is I have a huge poster with drawings of each ingredient. So let's say I have flour in my recipe. I'm going to draw, literally draw, a package of flour on my poster, okay? And the kids see all of that. Those so that's part of the visual stimulation. Then if I have spices in my recipe, I, let, I take one of my container, I open it, and I let everybody smell. So I usually work with a, a table that is kind of round, like a circle, and I pass it around. And I do that all over each ingredient. So I go really slow. So it's kind of long, but it really worth it because the kids that need more like a lower pace, it really works. So the kids have time to repeat each ingredient, pronounce it, and then we start cutting the ingredients. So that's how I do it. So the math is pretty obvious. When you measure all the ingredients, they get the math. Um, I always demonstrate, that's really important. Before you do any movement while you're cooking, always demonstrate to the kids because they don't know how to cut, they don't know how to do certain movements. And this is part of the fine motor skills. Like most of the time, they wanna <laughs> chop the peppers like this. I tell them, uh, no, 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 you gotta go slow like this, you know? So you, you guys are educators, most of you, you know what I'm talking about. So kids are kids. So you really have to demonstrate, very, very important. So you explain the safety measures when you use hot plates, of course. You use their feedback. So that's an important part that I really want to stop on it for a minute. While you cook, you always listen to what the kids are saying, their feedback. 
how do they feel about the whole process if they understand which country you are talking about which recipe you're talking about and you always repeat kind of repeat to kind of stimulate them oh do you remember the name of the recipe do you remember the name of this ingredient that's how i do it and when you do it like that it goes really smoothly because the kids have all your attention and you kind of like going 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 and they are with you so always try to bring them back as soon as you feel that they are you're losing them so that's how i do it basically all right so that's for the classroom management this is one of my favorite chefs look at him he's like so happy so we were doing a recipe and he was so proud to show me look Papa Cecil, look what i did so that recipe was from ivory coast and he was super 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 happy okay culturally responsive because of racism. So why are we doing African cooking? Um, like in my school, it's Afrocentric. So basically why we are doing this, because we believe that if children of African descent have a curriculum that is more appropriate to their culture, they learn better. That's the whole thing. So I'm gonna define a little bit um, why culturally responsive is so important because of racism. So because we are in a food desert, Bedford Stuyvesant is a food desert. Why is it called a food desert? Because we have uh, supermarkets with food that is highly priced to get a uh, fresh kale, fresh salad, fresh anything. It's really hard. It's very pricey and it's usually not fresh. So you will notice a lot of pharmacies, you will no notice a lot of fast food, a lot of dollar store, but to get a supermarket with really fresh food that, are, that is affordable, and especially we have a lot of um, projects, like I live where I live right now, I have a lot of projects around, and you can tell that the supermarket are not there to help minority people, to get access to fresh and affordable food. So it's a constant battle. So I'm just trying to define to you what is uh, a food desert. So a food desert is the result of structural racism. That's basically what it is. So let's move on to the recipes themselves. The first recipe I wanna to talk to you about is akara. In my country, in Benin, we call it ata. So it's made with black eyed peas. It's a very delicious recipe. It's high in protein, it's vegan, gluten-free, super easy to make. And my trick for this recipe is to add the beans really slowly. Like don't try to put the whole, the, your whole entire beans in the blender because your blender is gonna die, like literally, it's gonna be a disaster. So <laughs> just do it slowly and slowly and surely you will get there. And um, my little secret for the flavor is smoke shrimp powder. So I can tell you in the Q&A where to get it. Okay. All right, this recipe is from Djibouti. It's like a soup. So in this recipe, what I really insist on is I explain to the kids First, I showed them where was Djibouti. Then I explained the influence of different parts part of the world in the recipe. So this is part of what you're doing when you're cooking. You're just not cooking. You're explaining where are the, all the influences of the spices, where they come from, and all of that. This is another recipe. So this recipe was super interesting because we inter integrated in the recipe um, Indian cooking uh, ingredients. So I had to explain. So the kids were asking, oh, South Africa, okay, why do we use stuff from India? So this is the whole purpose of doing this. You have to, as you can tell, they were measuring the spices and they were asking questions. So that's what you want to do. You want to stimulate them to ask you questions. Okay, next slide. 
This is one of my favorite food in the world. This is Molokia. So it's, I, I kind of find it here on a farmer's market one day. And I was so shocked because I, in my childhood, I always used to eat this. And I could never understand it was the same thing because in Benin, we call it Nenui. So it doesn't have the same name at all. So I rediscovered it here. And this is very high, um, highly nutritious. And it's something that you eat with uh, a tomato sauce and also fufu. What we call fufu in Africa is just a generic name. It's just basically some type of flour made from yam, corn, or cassava, and it's cooked. So that's what we call fufu. I just want to make sure everybody understands what fufu is. All right. And I, I'm just going to interject to say we are going to send out um, these recipes afterwards. So okay. Yes. That's good to panelists or participants. Some people were asking, and we can help pass. Ah, them. okay. The recipes. Okay, sure. Yeah. And uh, so, so a couple minutes left. Yeah, I'm going to speed up a little bit. So on the recipes, this is a goosey. So this one is not really easy. It's um. It's, egusi is basically the seeds of a melon that you crush and you make it into like a powder and you, you use it in, um, in like a, a soup, I would say. So I'm gonna pass a little bit quicker on this. My next slide is about BSAP. Yeah, BSAP, so high in vitamin C. Okay, that's delicious. This is Chebujan, Senegalese cooking. So this dish is really, really good because it's a complete dish. You have the rice, you have the veggies, and you can add anything you want, whether meat or fish. So it's a really complete uh, meal. And this is sorghum. But you can really adapt all the recipes the way you like. You could use quinoa, you could use couscous, you could use anything you want. I even tried millet. Millet is really good. Okay, my last tip, which is, I think, the most important tip. Have fun, guys. Have fun. When you cook, the kids can see you're excited. If you are excited, they are excited. If you are sleeping, they're going to sleep, okay? <laughs> so that's the, that's the trick. Be excited and don't be scared to try recipes that look complex, but the way you bring it to them is the secret. Just bring it to them with a lot of love and be excited about it. Bring a good atmosphere, a good learning atmosphere, and you will see, uh, you'll be amazed actually by the result. So this is one of my hero. This woman is the first African woman who ever had a, a, a Nobel Prize, a um, Peace Nobel Prize. So I really love her and I just wanted to kind of dedicate this presentation to her. And I love what she said. She said, I do my part of the job as small as it is and I do my part. I'm, I will be like a hummingbird and I will do the best I can. That's what all of us should do. Another woman that I really admire is Bell Hooks. She said, the moment we choose to love, we begin to move against domination against oppression. The moment we choose to love, we begin to move forward freedom to act in ways that liberate ourselves and others. So this work liberated me and I hope I liberated also others. So that's the goal. Um, so I'm gonna introduce really quickly, quickly the next people that are I'm so happy I'm connecting. I connected with them because, um, so basically I met Bianca and Angelica and these amazing human beings and educators like me uh, through Rashid from grow to learn And we started exchanging about all the things I just spoke about, culturally responsive, why curriculum has to be linked with, um, you know, what the kids are more um, in tune with. Okay, so we decided to collaborate and our me meeting is really a blessing because having the same kind of vision is rare. You meet a lot of people, but it's rare that you really connect in such a strong way. And we are all working, doing the same thing. 
So I would like to introduce to you um, Bianca. And I get inspired so much about their work uh, as much as they get inspired by my work. And I, um, I really, um, I really want to insist on the fact that because of the coronavirus, we thought that this workshop was so needed because of all the stuff that are happening. It's more than ever an uh, urgency to talk about racism and talk about culturally responsive uh, curriculums. So I hope you guys enjoyed what I said, whatever I said, and I'm waiting for you in the Q&A. And I'm going to let Bianca and Angelica follow up with what I said. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Cecile. We feel the same about you, 100%. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and start screen sharing now um, and just kind of like go ahead to where we are now. Okay, so Angelica and I teach at PS14 in Corona. Um, Corona Queens is a predominantly um, Latinx community, but we have other communities. We have Egyptian communities, we have Chinese communities, Tibetan communities, um, and we have a bit of um, students from Africa, Haiti, um, African-American students. Angelica, am I forgetting anybody? That's pretty much our demographic, right? Um, I've been teaching there for the past 10 years, but I started with the DOE in 2001. Prior to that, I worked for the State Parks Department doing landscaping, uh, and I was an environmental interpreter. Um, I've taught music for the DOE, science, um, kindergarten, uh, and um, that's pretty much all about me. Angelica. Hi, yeah, I'm Angelica, as you already heard, and I have been working with Bianca for many years, many years now. I am a music teacher there. Uh, I teach band and strings, um, and then I do a lot of uh, music integration uh, in grades one through five. Prior to that, I was a classroom teacher. Um, and then my other passion is bilingual education. I also teach at uh, Hunter College in the bilingual ed ed department. So um, culturally responsive STEAM in the school garden, a little background about like why that ended up happening. Um, we have a class here. This was one of our bilingual fifth grade classes. This was a bilingual ICT, I believe at the time. Um, and this student here um, that you see in the Nike sweatshirt, Mateo, came to us not speaking Spanish or English. He spoke a dialect of, I believe it was Quechua, um, that was so rare that the DOE had no record of it. And as he started picking up Spanish and learning Spanish, he became very ashamed that of his original language. And we were horrified that he should feel stigmatized for being indigenous. Um, so we started talking about this, all those of us who work with the bilingual students and um, Angelica and I started looking at our population demographics. And it became really clear to us that um, between from 2015, 2016 to 2016, 2017, there was an increase in our Hispanic students that were identifying as American Indian. That went up. Um, and we started thinking about like, well, what does that mean as far as the curriculum, um, especially the social studies curriculum? Our children are being taught that Native Americans and Native South Americans, because Aztec Inca, that's part of the fifth grade social studies curriculum, um, the Iroquois and Lenape, that's fourth grade social studies, they're taught that these are people who live a long time ago, and that's that. So they're effectively, their own identities are being erased right in front of them. Um, so we happen to be put together um, our principal thought it was a great idea for us to team teach STEAM. And that was literally all we were told, your team teaching STEAM. So we said, what, what does that even mean? What are, <laughs> what are we going to do? So we started thinking about STEAM, and this is the perfect time for us to pilot um, culturally responsive teaching. We could really kind of 
deal with this kind of social studies aspect and um, we started looking into culturally responsive teaching, like what is it, right? Um, so according to Zaretta Hammond, culturally responsive teaching is when the teacher grounds a lesson in community issues that are relevant and meaningful to students' daily lives as a vehicle for teaching content. So in a nutshell, it's about helping culturally and linguistically diverse students who've been marginalized in schools build their skill and capacity to do rigorous work. We've been told your test scores, you know, they're not up to where they should be, but no one is telling us or asking our students what kind of knowledge are they bringing to the table. They were never given opportunities to demonstrate the funds of knowledge that they have from their own backgrounds, you know, and that to me is very personal. My father, when he first came here from Puerto Rico, he was told speak English, he moved to Corona and, you know, it's very stigmatized. And as a result, my parents didn't speak Spanish in the house because they were afraid that we would be stigmatized. And I had to fight to learn conversational Spanish. So these are very damaging things that unfortunately in this day and age, I still have heard teachers saying to our bilingual kids speak English, you know? So looking at culture responsive teaching, talking about that systematic reforms must be undertaken that deal with multiple aspects of achievement, academic, social, psychological, emotional, within different subject areas like math, science, reading, writing, social studies, across school levels. So this was a no-brainer for Angelica and I that STEAM is the perfect place for, for this to live and for us to really start piloting it in our air school. Yeah, no, and, uh, and uh, along with that, we also started to then think, okay, so what does that look like? What does uh, STEAM look like in the context of the of our school garden um, and with an ethnobotic, you know, approach to, to what we we're going to do. And we so, we so happen to have just been driving by this beautiful mural not too far away from our school, um, right by Flushing Meadows Park, and it really kind of just encompassed, I think, what culture responsive teaching means to us, right? We, we see that our students are linguistically and culturally diverse. Um, we have to take in, ma in mind what matters to them um, because that's, that's, that's how we know what their ways of knowing are. Um, and we can use these as entry points into their own learning. Um, and that's how we are going to be able to tap into um, all those literacies that um, go beyond the written word um, so that they can become these critical um, agents that can not only read the word, but can also read the world. So for us, defining culturally responsive and sustaining STEAM, typically you hear science, technology, engineering, art, and math. But to us, it was beyond that. It was social emotional learning, agriculture, activism, social studies, social impact, theater, environmental stewardship, ethnobotany, music, all of those things we felt were important to touch upon. So we had to do a lot of research because this curriculum didn't exist. Um, I was very lucky at the time to be training. I was in one of the teacher education um, courses at um, NYBG under Judith Hutton. And I fell in love with these books, Ethnobotany Explorers and Cultural Uses of Plants. Um, I have a BA in anthropology. So this was right up my alley. And starting the school garden, at we, we had just started the school garden right before we were tasked with doing this. So this was kind of like the perfect thing. Uh, and then Angelica had been working a bit with um, Huichol, um, Nirika Senor and painting and other things too. Right, Angelica? Yeah. Um, so we had this text, Huichol, Women, Weavers and Shamans, which is like a college level text, but it's all we had. So we were actually literally taking passages from the book that we thought the kids could handle. And this was mainstreaming. So we had kids from 12 to one to one special ed with gen ed mixed together and some bilingual kids. And we would take these passages and put them in small groups and they would dissect them together. They would, we would talk about words, like which words mean something to us. And, and the kids would kind of just kind of like dissect this. Um, we started noticing things that were themes like symbols, symbols in nature right? Um, and, and patterns in nature. Cycles, life cycles of plants, life cycles of animals, cycles of seasons, 
So these were some things that we identified as these were our driving kind of core. Um, it was the core of what we were teaching and everything was going to kind of like happen around that. And that's why the garden was the perfect place because we could observe these natural cycles. We could find these symbols all in our school garden. Plus we had like these huge groups of kids, like where else are you gonna put them <laughs> besides the school garden? Um, so we chose symbols, Angelica had looked into a little bit um, and we gave the kids these sheets to study of different symbols. Um, and then we looked at the symbols in weaving, um, in all of the art. And then we went outside and we said, what kinds of symbols are similar that we notice in our school garden? Squash life cycle came up right away. It was in the book. The squash were very important to the Huichol. We miraculously had a bumper crop of squash that year. So this fit perfectly. And the kids went outside, they diagrammed a the squash, they diagrammed the parts of the squash, the life cycle of the squash, they harvested the squash. Then they cooked with the squash. I was lucky enough to have just taken a course at Edible Schoolyard and I learned, um, you know, about cooking with kids and how you have, you know, breaking down the recipe. So let's say one group of kids is working on dry ingredients, another group of kids is working on wet ingredients, another group of kids is working on writing a how-to to teach others how to make butternut squash pancakes. And then we also had to get a lot of help, like from other <laughs> wonderful teachers. Um, we looked at weaving because weaving was really important to the Wichol. It was a passage that we found that the kids could handle and we gave the kids um, fiber and these aren't even real spindles. I had wheel and axles from teaching um, force and motion and just gave them to the kids with the fiber and said like, hey, in your group, figure this out. How could you turn this fiber into yarn using these materials? So it was kind of like a steam challenge and they did it. So we used that yarn plus other yarn um, to make um, cardboard looms and that involved a lot of math because they had to make divisions. They had to decide how many notches they wanted to make in their loom based on the size of um, their piece. Things like the patterns repeating. And then one day the kids realized um, that I said, okay, where do we wanna go from here? They, a child raised their hand and said, well, the Wichol, according to what we read, they used to make their own dye. They used to dye their yarn from plants. Like, could we do that? And I was like, sure, let's figure it out. And we went and got plants from the garden, but also, um, as Angelica's pointed out in the past, like turmeric is not part of the Wichol um, farming te technology, but it's something that we use. It's all about making these connections, right? So it's something that's used in our neighborhood that a lot of our families use and works very well for dyeing. So we introduced these kinds of things like purple cabbage. We were growing the Kalaloo in uh, or amaranth in our yard. And um, we'd never done this before, but we just put garbage bags on the children and we heated up the stuff and made the dye and, and it worked. And we'd studied the pigments, right? Why are we getting these colors? So we learned about anthocyanins and the kids wrote down what are the different pigments and, and they made kind of little tests in their notebook and when we could no longer use our garden because it was past our winter har harvest and just too cold, we continued our interdisciplinary thematic unit on uh, symbols and nature. So we went back and looked at how the Wichol observed the worlds around them um, to explain phenomena such as the moon cycle. Um, in this passage, uh, you're gonna see that uh, the Wichol actually observed to the world around them, like the trapdoor spider, for example, and, the and looked at the moon and said, you know, you know what? Um, it, we think that the moon, uh, as the moon is approaching the, uh, the, the new moon, that means that, um, that the, the Takakame, which is the, um, the, the, the spider, is going into the underworld where she's going to become the death goddess, right? And so the students learned about this. They also learned about the, uh, they also read science passages about, um, science articles about the, 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 about the faces of the moon. Um, they embodied it by actually like moving around the room and, and reenacting that. Um, they drew, they created these illustrations as you can see. Um, and then there are a lot of math connections to that as well. Um, 
for example, thinking about the relationship of the moon to the earth, to the sun, and thinking about how the face, uh, where, the, where the moon is in, in that particular face and the angle. So in this process, we realized that, you know, once we wrap with the Wichol unit, before we were done, we had an incident in which we were doing uh, yarn paintings and I said, does anybody else need to use the black yarn? And one of the kids shouts out, that's racist. And I was just really taken aback, like thinking this kid's clowning around about racism in my class. Like this, no, I'm not going to stand for this. But um, luckily, through Grow to Learn, there had been um, a having conversations with children about racism workshop, specifically in the garden setting. And Angelica and I just stuck everything and put everybody in a circle. And let's talk about this. Okay, why did you say that? Like what, you know, just instead of getting upset or thinking, why is this kid doing this? It's more like, well, yeah, asking the child, where is this coming from? And having these conversations with the children and letting them talk about, well, how do you feel when you hear somebody say something like that? What triggered this response and getting it out of the kids that they really felt racism was an injustice that they wanted to fight against. And they were very eager to fight racism, but no one was talking to them about what it actually was, or they couldn't have these conversations with their parents. They weren't comfortable. Even though they hear little snippets of things on the news, they were hyper um, aware of these kinds of things, but they didn't feel comfortable talking to their classroom teachers about it. So, and they were hearing a lot of weird stuff from older siblings. So we said, okay, we really need to think about this and how is this impacting our children who are from Africa, our children who are African-American who are hearing this stuff. They're, they're much smaller population if you saw that in our population demographics earlier. Um, so we said, okay, how about the diaspora? Um, many of our children don't even realize how connected to Africa they are. We have kids from the Caribbean that are, you know, they might have some idea. There's a lot of identity stuff there, right, to work out and that they should be proud of that connection. And we needed to show them that connection, that between the Huichol and the Ashanti people of West Africa, they were going to notice a lot of connection because there is this amazing diaspora there, right, that connects us all. So we looked at things like um, Adinkra symbols, and the kids compared those with the Huichol symbols. We looked at um, and read a lot of Anansi stories because this tied in with the spider mythology of, of the Huichol. Um, Kante cloth as a weaving technology. Um, and the kids took symbols and we had them make t-shirts, which we initially thought we were going to be cute and do potato prints. But let me just tell you now that plastic knives and potatoes, like, just don't try it. <laughs> We ended up using cardboard in the end. If you have older kids and you're comfortable giving them exacto knives, like high school kids, like that will probably work and be beautiful. But in elementary school, just don't, don't even bother. Um, so see some of the books, like a lot of Anansi, we watched Anansi videos, we read the books. We had this book about the Ashanti where we learned what kinds of food they grew, right? Were we growing any of those things in our garden? Did, did we troll grow any of the same things? So performing in comunidad. So you, you heard of all these different snap, like snapshots of all these different curriculum or uh, ideas that we had in our classroom. But while we were piloting this program for our first year from the beginning, we knew that it was important to also center the voices of families and really of all of our community partners. Um, so from the very start of the year, we thought about um, and everybody who is going to help us in, in, uh, in our vision. And so um, we have the Beacon program. We have, we're a community school based organization. So but prior to our partnership with them, we had day school and then we had night school. We never worked together. Um, and Bianca started partnering up with the uh, Beacon program. So we had our first uh, STEAM night um, where we had all these different stations, interactive stations um, hosted or facilitated by both teachers in our school, uh, daytime school, and then our youth teachers um, in the evening who were doing um, uh, centers like pigment paintings. Uh, we also enlisted lots of our parents um, in this. Um, uh, we, had, we have these after school green teams that occur um, usually on Fridays, um, but you can see that they were 
critical uh, in uh, creating our beds, in um, designing and designing and de creating and designing our beds, in, and create in uh, creating the catchments, uh, water catchments and uh, barrels, as you can see on the right, um, in uh, setting up the um, the uh, shed. Um, Bianca and her team on Saturday, the all, uh, on a Saturday morning, all got there. Uh, again, parents and teachers, everybody together in order to create that. Um, and then, very important as well is our um, cultural institutions, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit more about in a minute. And our a local, you know, our a local government. So uh, Bianca partnered up with uh, Senator Rama's office, and because of that initiative, um, we were able to get funding and now have a hydroponics lab. Um, so that took a couple of years. You'll see the timeline in a minute, but um, all of those partners really helped us uh, to to enact a vision. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, and then here are some of the partnerships that um, you know we've we we've, we've tapped into and developed up over the next over the last couple of years. So we also thought about performing community quite literally. Um, as we've talked about, we have very diverse uh, students and we are always thinking about um, their different entry points for learning. Um, here during our harvest celebration, um, for the, uh, we learned that the Wichol um, actually use a lot of music in their celebration. So here's uh, an, an authentic piece called Son para la Siembra, obviously transcribed um, into you know, Western transcription, and the kids are using another modality. They're using their recorders in order to perform the piece and engage not only in embodying the content, but also performing it um, in an extra, uh, extra lingual way. Um, we also tapped into a lot of cultural institutions. So again, performing not only our ways of knowing in the school, but really celebrating and, and sharing it with um, other um, institutions around the community, one being the New York Hall of Science. So this is our fourth grade um, a curriculum. We haven't really talked too much about it, but we were also um, doing fourth grade. With, with, with fifth grade, we did the Beach Hall um, unit, uh, thematic unit. And with the fourth grade, we actually explored uh, Native Americans um, as part of the New York State curriculum. So the students, uh, Bianca showed, taught the students how to compare um, how the, uh, the, the, the Lenape agricultural practices versus the colonist agricultural practices. The students then decided that they were going to design their own three sisters bed, which is what you see here, the maize, the, the, uh, the beans, and the squash. Um, and then they engaged in cooking. They also um, learned about the three sisters through a play that they, uh, they rehearsed. Um, we then contacted the New York Hall of Science who lent us their space and so they were able to share what they knew through presentation boards and through this performance of the three sisters. The uh, garden though also became a space for reflection um, and for sharing their identity. So they became these Cuenta Me Algo, Tell Me Something spaces. Uh, we talked about this Nirika Huichol uh, form of narrative painting. The students didn't uh, tell other people's stories, they told their own narratives in writing and also through these visuals. Um, our music students also tapped into the um, garden space, um, learning to see and hear that multisensorial um, uh, pedagogy that Cecilia was talking about in order to think, um, create their own stories of their community. And if you click really quickly, um, you can kind of, oh, eh. <laughs> if you if you click on the link very quickly, you'll be able to kind of see some of the, um, some of the things that, yeah. Well, anyway, they were, they were performed, they, they performed their own compositions around the, um, around the, oh, there we go around the around their garden but also the community and as you can and as you can see the theme is it's very obviously they were obviously very inspired by by the work that they had been doing um in in this space so let's play a spring song and spooky garden song which actually ended up being um featured uh or entered into the queensboro um festival of arts uh, it's a very proud moment for us and that's we're almost <laughs> i know we have like two minutes so <laughs> Um, and then we had an end of the year celebration when we really brought all these partners, the parents and the teachers and, uh, who were part of a green team, the students who had been learning uh, uh, through their thematic unit planning, our musicians, uh, and we had a garden celebration. Uh, and then New York One um, came over, we, we invited them over, they came over and, um, and, and again, another way to, um, to celebrate uh, a group of students who usually um, don't have that 
that ability, that, um, that space to, to show their ways of knowing, um, which is so important. So as for next steps, we started realizing, okay, what other voices aren't being heard in our school and our Asian population? It's really difficult for them to feel like engaged and uh, a lot of things are very bilingual Spanish and English in our school. And we have these like wonderful kids and staff, right? Um, specifically from China. So I started getting people, um, and this time when we had a staff green team form and we had Chinese paras and teachers. And I said, if we're gonna have this hydroponics lab, because that was starting, what kind of vegetables would, would you wanna see here? What kind of vegetables would engage the kids and their families and make them feel like, whoa, this is here? Like, the, I can't believe this, I'm seeing this vegetable. So they picked out most of what we were gonna be planting in the hydroponics lab. And this is my friend Theo, he's one of my monitors. He loves hydroponics so much that he became, he became a hydroponics monitor. Um, and the kids would have these harvests and they, we read to them the ugly vegetables, um, which I love. This amazing story about children, a child feeling very strange that, you know, her, her traditional Chinese vegetables don't look like everyone else's vegetables until her mom makes a soup and then the, all the neighbors come and they're like, this is delicious. And then they start swapping seeds and they get to plant flowers, but the neighbors are doing the ugly vegetables, you know, which are not ugly. Obviously those of us who love plants, there's no such thing as ugly vegetable. Um, and these were our greens, our salad bar, the NFT system over here, which, which that was a partnership with New York Sunworks actually. Um, Senator Ramos came in later um, to help with renovating our garden because I we've only showed you nice pictures but that's a really interesting space that needs a lot of work um but New York Sunworks found us a donor in a hedge fund called um Regal that came and, and gave us the the equipment for for um the hydro lab so that way we could be growing inside as well as outside and then we started thinking okay what else how do we connect community action and community activism to what we're doing. Let's think about a problem we have in our garden and that problem's water scarcity. There's one hydrant that's outside of the garden. Um, we have to get a permit every year. And so we looked at the book, I Am Farmer. Um, and if you guys wanna learn a little bit more about this, um, the foundation of the farmer that's featured in the book, it, there's a link in here and he's done some beautiful work. Um, and again, he was stigmatized in his village for wanting to farm, um, but ended up like creating this amazing environmental movement. And One Well, which is the story of water on earth. And then having the kids, just giving them a pile of stuff from the science lab, like, old straws, like whatever we could find, and having them first draw in groups what their irrigation system would look like for the garden, and then construct a model and see how it works in a tree of soil. And we gave them different examples from the around the world of irrigation systems, um, one of which came straight from Grow to Learn. We were using sub-irrigated beds um, anyway, thanks to them. Um, and then these are some of the concepts and this is like our guiding principles and, and that's it. That's where we leave you. So <laughs> um, it's all about decolonizing garden education, land acknowledgement, recentering indigenous spaces, teaching our kids, you know, whose land are they actually gardening on, um, engage and how can we steward that land, right? Um, engaging in interconnected learning practices that build permaculture, like all systems working together and how permaculture isn't just for gardening, it's also for community and ways that we work with each other to build strong communities. Um, the school garden is a restorative ecosystem that views family, cultural community, funds of knowledge as capital, right? Social, family, aspirational, linguistic resistance and fostering generous spaces for social transformation very important. Um, we have to empower these kids, our kids, right? They're our kids and we have to make them feel powerful that they can create change and they're not just stuck in the situations that they're in and that um, Cecile mentioned earlier about structural racism, and institutional racism, and that these are not, none of their situation is their fault, but that together, if we get every facet of the community, parents, the teachers, the community organizations together, we can do something and we can um, 
create an environment where our kids have equity and they have the things that kids in other neighborhoods have. That's where the hydro lab came from. I went to a training at a school in Manhattan that had a hydroponics lab and I was like, why can't we have one of these? Okay, let's make some phone calls. Um, and then promoting science learning identities among minoritized students. Our kids don't see themselves as scientists. They don't see examples of scientists. Um, luckily, that's starting to change, um, but letting them know that the, whatever stereotype they have in their minds of what a scientist is, is, you know, we call them farmer scientists. That's, that's what they are, that's what they do. And then if you guys want um, to contact us at all, this is our information. It will be there. I guess that this is going to be shared out. Um, and thank you so much for for being here and and sharing in this work with us. And thanks to grow to learn and grow NYC and to Laura and Chantel and Kristen for giving us this platform um, and Cecile for for this crazy ride that we're on together. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you all so much as well. Um, you got a lot of love in the in the chat. People are really enjoying the presentation and we have a couple of questions. Um, so if people who are participating today, we're going to stick around for another few minutes and you're more than welcome to stick around and send us some more questions um, for our presenters today. So um, Bianca, do you want to stop screen sharing and then they'll be able to see all of you at the same time and so the first question we have um, is, how have you changed your teaching style, lessons, and programs um, into a virtual setting? We kind of knew we were going to get that question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we were expecting it. Um, I mean, I can feel that as much as like, I still had a section of hydroponics I had to cover when we went virtual. So it came down to making a lot of um, either videos of myself um, doing plant tutorials and at-home projects that you can do with things you find around your house, like bot a lot of bottle gardening projects. So it was either have the kids do a Zoom with me live, like, hey guys, show up with your plastic bottle and, you know, and some scissors and let's make this thing. And I taught them how to make um, different kinds of growing systems using two liter bottles um, if they had them at home. Um, for those moments when it was like too much, cause you know, I also teach like grade three, four and five science. Like that's my full regular load. Um, I would find videos either of kids doing hydroponics or through New York Sumworks. There's actually been some great videos on PBS Learning Media on New York Sumworks and their hydroponics. So I would put those in my Google Classroom for the kids to access and then have them have a conversation with each other in the comments about what, would, what could we try? What, I, what are ideas in here that you saw that you would like us to do at school? What are ways we could change this to make it fit our school better? That kind of a thing. And then they always like to bring like plant show and tell. Like they started that. They just started being like, look, Miss Bibaloni, remember my plan I was talking about? And then, so I started doing all these weird things that I still have around from then like, Let's try to grow the top of a pineapple, guys. I've never done that either. Let's just let's just do it. And everybody would have their little plant like so proud, like, look at my avocado seed that sprouted. So that's how that's how. Awesome. I also think um, you know, the online remote learning is a great way to tap into people that can't come visit your school. And so uh, you know, whether it be uh, older students who can help you or maybe other I'm not, I, so I'm a music teacher, so I can only speak through that at lens, but inviting uh, other musicians, inviting other like former students to come in and teach and kind of mentor. Um, so think about those people that you would like to, you, you would love to invite into your classroom or into, into your own spaces and just to bring them over, you know, in a virtual sense. And uh, it just makes it for a more enriching experience. Very cool. Um, so this other question we have is about some of the challenges that you may have been overcoming. So do you have any strategies for student resilience around design challenges? So that's kind of a specific question, but if you want to speak to that as well as just some of the challenges you had instituting your curriculum as well. Well, I mean, as I kind of like briefly mentioned, we were given no curriculum and we were given no dedicated space. We weren't assigned a space to do this. We were just told, you're each getting a class, you have to teach them together at the same time, 
and you have to teach STEAM, which at the time in 2016, 2017, that was still like, you know, so we just said, okay, let's take them outside as much as possible because we can fit them all there. Um, we used the, one of the small cafeterias when we could get it, you know, and when we couldn't, we would split up. So you saw some with the moon cycle, Angelica was doing small, not small group, but like she had her class doing that. And sometimes we would swap. So I would take one class and be doing Three Sisters Tacos in their classroom while Angelica was doing another piece, like maybe rehearsing the Three Sisters play. And then the next week we would swap groups. So that was one way that, that we managed that. And other challenges, I mean, we've run the gamut. That's another thing that binds us with Cecile is that um, we both have gardens that existed and were thriving and are now in a state of limbo because of, um, yes. they don't know, exist anymore. <laughs> yeah. Transitioning. It's partly in the hydroponics lab and partly got moved. Um, we had mm -hmm. crazy rodent problems this past winter. Um, and as far as resilience, right? So we're demonstrating to the kids that we're not going to let some silly rats stop us. Like we're going to figure this out. We don't stop right and we also make sure the kids understand things like teamwork that if we're all working together and with our parents and with the community members that it's much easier than if you're trying to do things in isolation so we don't ever do design challenges alone they're always working with each other and working things out and we have things always posted in the room like hashtag challenge accepted um big thing that we teach the kids if you're not making mistakes you're not doing science Science is all about making mistakes. If your hypothesis doesn't come out to be correct, rejoice. Because you just learned something that you weren't even thinking that you were going to learn. Yeah. It's all about that languaging and posting mm -hmm. that languaging around the room. Yeah, same thing when you're cooking. There's no right or wrong. Like, there's always some mistakes. And in the mistake, you learn how that, like, the, the children, you teach them as you are teaching yourself. So that's why I wanted to to say that the feedback from the community, from the families, from the student, you use all of that and you incorporate it and that's how everybody moves forward, yeah. Great, I think we just have time for one more question, which is, is there a site where I can visit to get more ideas that Bianca just gave? And I think that could be in response to um, like the gardening from home or the virtual gardening, which I'll just give a, a plug right now for GrowNYC, distancelearning.org, and you'll get the link. That's where we're going to post this workshop and a lot of other ideas for at-home gardening, um, recycling, and like activities to do with kids that don't require a ton of materials. It's, a lot of times it's just stuff you dig out of your recycling bin or things like that. Um, I know a lot of great ideas are also like on the Edible Schoolyard site. And if you all want to add in some other places where you get your resources, if you have anything specific you want to tell them about. Well, yeah, I mean, look, I, like I said, I worked for the parks department for many years, but not growing food. I didn't know what I was doing when I started. I had to take these classes at NYBG, PBG, QBG, like all of the GBs, the BGs, and, um, and, and Grow to Learn. I was literally going to a Grow to Learn workshop every single week in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> it was constant and it was wonderful and then things like going to grow together right so other green thumb resources as well yeah. edible schoolyard like they're just so amazing and their website has all these great resources new york Sunworks. um they also have some really great curriculum resources as well all right that's awesome and we are in addition to the resources we just said um in your follow-up email you'll also get the bibliography that Bianca, Angelica, and Cecile used to make all of this amazing presentation. So I just wanna say thank you once again to our guest presenters, um, and we hope to see you all this fall for some more workshops with Grow NYC. All right, bye, bye everyone. Thank you.